Hey friends, the next two weeks are kind of different. In the spirit of the season, this week I'm going to meditate on the death of Jesus Christ. And next week we're going to talk about his resurrection and how this central event in human history changes everything, including your life. Um, today's meditation was painful. It was really difficult for me to write. And I'm not going to lie, it's going to be tough for you to listen to. But I want to encourage you to really spend time letting, letting it sink in. Because so often we go through this holy season and kind of just breeze right through it. Let this have the impact it's supposed to have in your life. Because when we look at the death of Jesus for us, it reminds us of who God is, who we are, what we're worth, what life is all about. And make sure you share this with everybody that you know. I also want to share a real blessing with you guys. On Easter Monday, we're dropping a new program to help renew your marriage called Renewed. Go to reallifecatholic.com forward slash marriage. It's only available for free for about 45 days, so do not delay. God who saved us can save anything, including your marriage. With that, God bless you. Let's enter into that meditation on the death of Jesus because he loves you. The central image of Christianity is horrifying. I had a dear friend who converted from Judaism to Catholicism. He was a non-practicing Jew. And he walked into a church because his mom was becoming a Catholic. And he said he was shocked by what he saw. He saw a man being executed, stretched out in front of everybody, bleeding, looking out at all the people in the church. And he's like, Chris, it's just, you get used to these images as a Catholic. He said, like, pretend that you'd never seen this before. It would be like walking into a church and seeing a big statue at the center of a guy strapped to an electric chair being executed and just shaking in pain. It stunned him. Because usually, when you walk into a house of worship, the kind of spiritual image that we expect is something that looks a little more like Buddha. You know, a guy sitting there peacefully, with his eyes closed, turned in on himself, resting. Here's the literal opposite. A man stretched out, eyes open, turned out of himself in, in agony. When his mom was baptized, he was there for it, and he looked at the same exact cross, and suddenly it all looked different to him. Instead of horror, he saw something stunningly beautiful in that man in agony. He realized that as he was looking out, he was looking for him. That he was there because of love. My friend Justin entered the baptismal waters the Easter after his mom. But his conversion really started with just looking at the cross. You know, St. John, when he writes about the crucifixion of Jesus, quotes a scripture from Zechariah written 500 years earlier. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. Today, I want to invite you just to look with me at the cross. To look in detail at what Jesus did out of love for us. Because I think we get too used to this. We stop letting it both horrify and move us. We don't perceive the depth of his love for us because we just glance over. What did he really do out of love for us? When we really look at that, we see the face of God. We see who he is. We see who we are and what we're worth. All in that silent face looking out from the cross. But before we back up and dive in to what he did for us on Good Friday 2,000 years ago, I want to back way up before that to before time because it reminds us of why he did what he did. Listen, God created you for one simple reason, for one simple dream that he had before he laid the foundations of the universe. He created you for joy, eternal joy. Don't believe me? Read the last pages of the Bible. Heaven is described as a wedding banquet, a place where everyone has a ridiculously large smile forever. That's why he made you. He summed up his teachings in the Gospel of John by saying the words, I have told you these things, so my joy may be in you. And the surest path to joy is love. And the greatest love is God himself. Scripture tells us that God is love. So heaven, that joy-inducing wedding banquet, is really being in the love that is God forever. That's why he made you. Now, if something's made for one particular purpose, and he's used for a different purpose, it gets broken. When my kids use the microwave as a fork warmer, that's not what that's for. Guys, we're made by God and for God, 
in the first pages of the Bible. We messed up the beautiful plan, the dream of God. We chose not God. We chose to reject Him, and in so doing, we broke ourselves. And yet He made all that part of His plan. And from the very beginning, it's clear in the Bible that we need a Savior. Now, people struggle with all different aspects of the faith. They're not sure if they believe in God. They're not sure if they believe that Jesus is God. They're not sure if they believe that God loves them. But I'll tell you what, everybody agrees on this point. Everybody knows we need a Savior. Don't believe me? Watch the next election cycle. <laughs> By the way, quick tangent, the Savior's name is not Don, and it's not Joe. As important as all that stuff is, there's something more important. That stuff isn't all important. But when it comes to our fundamental brokenness, we all know that we have this angst inside, that we need a Savior and we can't save ourselves. So we needed the infinite God to bridge the gap for our infinite offense, for having offended His infinite goodness. And that's why He did what He did. So let's look upon Him now and think in detail about what exactly He did out of love for us. His passion started in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means olive press. The night before he died, he was crushed. He was pressed by the worst experience of human stress that we could possibly imagine. Scripture tells us that contemplating his death the next day, his sweat became as drops of blood. There's actually a condition called hematohydrosis, where blood can mix with your sweat. And there's historical accounts of people entering a battle where they know they might die or will likely die. And there's, there's either blood pigment or blood itself mixing with the sweat as it poured down their faces. He saw in great detail all that he would go through the next day. He begged the Father that it would pass, and yet he said, not as I will, but as you will. In that same garden, he was betrayed by a friend with a kiss. Of all the pains in life, guys, I think betrayal from someone that you trust is one of the worst ones. And Jesus felt that out of love for us. He was dragged to a court, an illegal court, at Caiaphas's house before the Jewish rulers of his day. And there's one line that strikes me and always blew my mind about his trial at Caiaphas's house. It says, one of the officials nearby, as he was being tried, slapped him in the face. Guys, this is the maker of space and time. This is the God and creator of the universe, slapped in the face. And he could have called down a thousand bolts of lightning to kill the guy who slapped him in the face. But he kept his calm and he just said, why did you slap me? He was made to spend a night alone in Caiaphas' house, lowered down into a cistern, just by himself. Nobody else around, all night to think about exactly what he was going to go through the next day. Early in the morning, he was made to stand on trial before an earthly king. Again, I repeat, this is the king of the universe, the maker of space and time, standing before an earthly king, answering his questions in humility. And then Pilate, because he didn't want to make Rome angry, and he didn't want to make the Jewish leaders angry. Just tried to find an easy way out. So he thought, I'll make Jesus look completely pathetic so that they at least drop the case, and that there's no riots, and that I don't have to put Jesus to death. So he had Jesus scourged. Now the Roman flagrum was a, a, a series of small dumbbells off these whips. So what happened when you were whipped in a Roman scourging is that these dumbbells would wrap around all of your body, and they'd pull it off. There's an early Christian historian, Eusebius of Caesarea, who describes Christians who were persecuted for their faith by scourging, and he said that their bones and entrails were exposed. This is what God went through. It's the horror of what God went through out of love for you. And then, Pilate hadn't commanded this. The soldiers did this part for fun. They wove a crown of thorns and pressed it on his head. And because a, a small crown, like the kind we often see at churches, would have fallen off, they probably would have woven a helmet and beat it down on his head. 
So all the nerve endings in the top of his head were pierced by this crown of thorns. And if you've ever had a head injury, you know how much those bleed. So after the scourging and the crowning with thorns, there probably wasn't a part of our Lord's body that wasn't red and covered in blood. And then our God was made to carry his own cross. It was about a 200 pound cross beam that was laid on his shoulder, which had already been ripped bare by the scourging. And the Shroud of Turin shows evidence of a hard fall that happened while he carried that cross. There's cuts all over his knees, a deep wound on his shoulder. So it's as if he fell down and then that 200 pound beam smashed on his shoulder. His neck jerked so hard that it likely partially paralyzed him and he hit the ground on his face. See, the Shroud of Turin actually shows that his eye is absorbed into the right orbit. Psalm 22, which prophesies about the crucifixion of Jesus, comes to mind. It says, I am a worm and no longer a man. I want you to think about what God looked like after he carried his cross, before he even got to the place where he was crucified. And then he got to the place of Golgotha, where he laid down his life. When you were crucified, what they would do is tie ropes to your wrists and stretch your body out so that it dislocated all your bones. And then in that dislocated, stretched position, they would take a nail and pierce your wrist with it. So they knew from experience that if they pierced your hand, you would just rip off and fall down from the cross. So instead, they went right through all the nerves, the median nerves, and just sent balls of fiery pain shooting down your arms. And it would have made your thumb collapse into your hand. That's why in the Shroud of Turin, you don't see Jesus' thumbs. Then they took a third nail and pierced both of his feet with that one nail and pinned them to the cross. And death was by asphyxiation on a cross. You had to writhe up and down on that cross because you were stretched out so hard that in order to exhale, you had to pull your body up until you surrendered to the weight of your body and died. Guys, the Romans perfected this form of execution to humiliate the political prisoners, the political enemies of Rome. You weren't crucified with clothes on. Jesus was stark naked in front of everyone. And the Roman soldiers would mock those who spent those hours writhing, and they said it was the dance of death. That's what they called it. And so Jesus is here dancing the dance of death, squirming and writhing to breathe. This is your God. Look upon him who you've pierced. And if you've been with a loved one and they're final hours. You know this dance of death, don't you? There's beautiful and inspiring words, and Scripture records those. But then there's those hours where there's just pain. Not much is said. Guys, Jesus made those hours for you and for your loved ones sacred. He's there. He's there right with you in those moments where you want to say, God, where are you? You know where he is? He's on the cross right next to you saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you would never have to say those words alone. And then Mark 15, Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. This is the greatest injustice in human history. Deicide, the killing of God by flawed human beings. Phil Kiggy wrote a beautiful song where he highlighted the divinity of Christ as he suffered for us. And the lyrics are, his holy fingers made the bow that grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. In this death of God, who is also the perfect man, you could see all the ugliness and all the sin of the human condition, all our need for a savior, all converge and come into focus in one place. The failure of God's chosen people to follow the law, to follow the Torah, the misuse and abuse of religious authority, which is profoundly sinful, politicians washing their hands and letting an innocent man go to death so they could preserve their careers, friends denying and being cowardly, Good old-fashioned bloodlust from the Roman soldiers. 
It seems that every vile thing about humanity converged on Jesus. And why? He did that so that, in the words of N.T. Wright, he could lure sin itself into a corner so that in his flesh it might be conquered, beaten, condemned, and destroyed by the infinite sacrifice that we could never make for ourselves. But guys, why this way? Even though it makes sense that there's this infinite sacrifice made to atone for the offense against our infinitely good God, couldn't he have done it some other way? He is, after all, God. Yeah, he could have. He could have snapped his fingers and just set everything right. Why did he choose this way? St. Paul puts it beautifully. God proved his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, in other words, when you didn't deserve it, when you couldn't earn it, because you can't earn love, by the way. My wife has never said, Chris, I love you, and heard it in response, of course. Look at the dishes I've done. Come, come on. How much less the love of God. While we were sinners, he died for us. Why did he do it this way? Because, guys, there's literally nothing more you could do to prove your love for someone than to die for them. God in all his infinite majesty and beauty and power and goodness literally couldn't have done more than he did for you on the cross to prove his love for you. Pope Benedict XVI wrote in Deus Caritas Est, God's passionate love for his people, for humanity, is at the same time a forgiving love. It is so great that it turns God against himself, his love against his justice. What he did on the cross was an outward expression of what had already happened in his own heart, that God loves you so much that his own heart was torn asunder for his people. This is God's love for you. Any father understands this love just by looking in their own hearts. Now, we're not perfect. I'm not a perfect dad by any stretch of the imagination, but my kids all know that I love them enough to die for them, to sacrifice for them, to chase them down if they're going astray. This is the love of the Father for you. One beautiful story that displays that love. There was an earthquake in Armenia in 1988. This earthquake left 30,000 people dead in four minutes. And among the countless buildings that collapsed, one of the buildings tragically was a school where there was a bunch of elementary children. So all the parents who had survived ran up to the school to see if their kids were alive. And all they found was a pile of rubble. So a few parents ran up to the rubble to shout for their kids and see if they heard a response and rip a couple bricks off. But after a few minutes, they realized this is hopeless. So they all just stopped, except for one dad. He kept going brick after brick, ripping them off, calling his child's name. After five hours, people just all left him. After 12 hours, people were mocking him. After 38 hours, he took one final brick off, and there was his son with his friends in a pocket of air. And he said, see guys, I told you my dad would get us out. This is the love of God for you. Then when we found ourselves in need of a savior covered in the rubble of sin, he didn't give up on us, but brick after brick with his bloodied hands, he saved us. And yet we still wonder, does God love me? And at every mass you hear the answer, body of Christ. Do I matter? Body of Christ. Did my sins take away my inherent worth? Body of Christ. Does anyone notice me? Body of Christ. What's my net worth? Body of Christ. Guys, he's on the cross, and he's looking out, not just for the whole world, he's looking out for you. And when we look at him with the eyes of faith, we can see in that twisted, bloodied face the most beautiful image in all of history. When we look upon him whom we have pierced, we can see the heart of who God is. We can see who we are and what we're worth. We could see that our suffering has purpose. We could see the summary of every rule and moral demand in Christianity. We see it all when we look on him who will be pierced. That's why we call it Good Friday. Let's end where we began. And they will look upon him whom they've pierced. 
I want you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and look upon him. I want you to imagine Jesus hanging on the cross, and you're there in the crowd. And he looks down, not just at the crowd, but at you. He locks eyes with you. Stay there. What are his eyes saying to you? What does he want back? On the cross, Jesus said the words, I thirst. He's there looking out at the world, looking for you. He didn't just want water, he wanted you. All that is you. Your sins, your flaws, your hopes, your dreams, your brokenness. He didn't die just so he could receive your praise and all your good deeds. He died to save you. Let him. Stay in that gaze and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of yourself. We give you ourselves in return, everything we are. We repent of our sins and we give you permission to do what you died to do. We ask you to be our Savior and our Lord. By doing this, Jesus, wow, may we quench your thirst on the cross. Thank you for showing us who you are on the cross and for showing us our worth on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you.